In the previous video, we set up our blog so that we can take markdown files and we can render them with HTML that makes it look decent. Um, the most notable changes are, uh, you know, whenever we have this, it'll start generating things like H1 tags, paragraph tags, and it'll all make the HTML look decent. Um, but on top of that, whenever we have things like code blocks, we are now adding syntax highlighting to them so that we can actually see a decent blog post. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the server up and you'll see here that if I render one of these pages like how to boil eggs, um, it starts to look decent here, but if we do IO reader, um, this is one where we can see the actual syntax highlighting. Now we don't have this aside type format that I have working right now, but that's fine. Um, that's something that'll come later. What I want to do now is I want to start taking the blog post that we have, and I want to start adding front matter to it so that we can start defining metadata that we need when we're rendering these blog posts. And you'll see here that um, we have my blog and by John Calhoun, both hard coded. So if we go to our code, and look at main.co um, where I have this post data things like the author and title are currently being hard-coded down here before we render the template and I'm doing that right now because I don't have a way to extract it from the blog post and that's where metadata is going to be helpful it's going to allow us to add things like the author of the post the title of the post um, maybe the publication date and a bunch of other fields that we might need access to and we're going to be able to extract them from the blog post and then render them however we want to and this is especially useful because when we come back here to our page, um, you'll see that when we get to the head and the title tag, we usually want to put something like the blog title inside of this so that whenever we were to link the page from somewhere else, or if it gets shown up into a search engine or something like that, um, you know, like if we link it in Slack, it's going to pull that title from it. So we want it to be able to pull the correct title for each blog post. And right now we don't have a way of pulling that from the markdown. So mar or front matter is the typical way to do this. And um, there's a couple of different formats for it. Um, there's going to be YAML, TOML, and um, JSON are all pretty common ones, which I can show you here. Um, they all have slightly different markings that you use, um, but these are all pretty standard at this point. So you kind of just decide which one you want to use and go from there. I personally am going to opt to use TOML because that's the one that I see most often personally, and it's the one I've become used to. So I'm going to go ahead and use that, but feel free to use whatever you want. So I'm going to start by just adding some front matter to my different blog posts so that I have it. So I'm going to first go to the how to boil eggs one. And rather than like going through and typing all this, I'm just going to go ahead and paste it in here and then walk you through why I added each field and what I think they might be useful for. So first is the title. Um, I think it's important just to have the title of the blog post so we can put it inside of that head tag um, inside of the title tag. Next is the description. And this is just going to be a quick summary of what the blog post is about so that if it happens to be on like an index page that shows 10 blog posts, you can quickly describe what the blog post is about. Next is the date. And this is going to be used for things like sorting the blog posts or potentially you might want to render the date on the page if it has time sensitive material. So like if you're talking about like, hey, there's a sale for seven days on this cool product that I like, um, you might want to go ahead and add a date so that people know when it was published and get some time sensitive information from it. Um, this can also be useful if you're writing um, technical content about like a library or something, you might want to add like a uh, go version equals and go 1.22 or something. Um, there's a bunch of different things you could add here depending on what makes the most sense. Um, you just sort of pick the tags that are going to make sense and you go from there. Um, it just you're going to want them on every single blog post so whether or not you need it you, you might have to add some other metadata here to sort of dictate whether this is time sensitive or not um, personally i don't like to render the date on the page because most of the content i write is about go and most of the time in go anything i'm writing is generally going to be applicable no matter what version of go it is but that's not true of every programming language or every framework so depending on what you're writing about that might not be the case okay so next we have um, the author and this is all going to be fields related to the author. So we have like author.name, author.email. These are all what's going on here. And this is just so that I can render the author this way. Truthfully, I don't expect other people to be posting blog posts, but it's nice just to have the option. All right, so I have the front matter for this blog post. Let's go ahead and add some for the other blog post. It's basically going to be the same type thing, just uh, slightly different information, just so we have it. So slightly updated. Um, now that both of our posts have metadata to work with, we need to decide on a library to parse this out. Because if we were to run the server right now, um, you'll see that this does not render correctly. Um, you see the front matter is being rendered, and that's not really what we wanted. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a library that will parse out this front matter, and then it'll give us the rest of this uh, markdown to be rendered the way we'd normally render it. Um, there's a couple options for this. One of them is a, an extension for Goldmark. And I'll bring it up here so you can see it. Um, 
This right here is a library that is an extension for Goldmark. The way you use it is you set it up as an extension whenever you're setting up Goldmark, and then you use a context when you're parsing it. And this extension will parse out the front matter, store the information inside of the context, and then later in your code, you can get the context and pull the front matter from it. I personally don't want to go this route. Um, I would rather just use a third party library that I've used in the past, where what this one does is it parses the front matter and then gives you back the rest of the markdown file as this rest variable. And then you can pass that into whatever markdown parsing library you like. And I, one, I've used this, so I just know it works well. So I like that. Um, the second reason why I like this is that it doesn't matter which markdown library you have, you know, it's going to work and it's not really going to, you know, cause issues with that. So if I have one that is completely agnostic to the markdown library I'm using, I feel like that's the best option. So let's go ahead and go get this. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this code. Let's do go get. And now that we have it added, um, what I want to do is I want to add a struct type so that I can parse out this front matter. And you'll see here that in this example, the way they're doing it is they define a struct, they add some struct tags to it. In this case, they're using YAML. And then once they have the struct declared, they parse the front matter and they pass in the input, which is like the markdown contents. And then they pass in a pointer to the struct that they want to decode it to. And this will parse the front matter, decode all the fields, it's sort of like your JSON decoding. It'll go ahead and pull them into this struct type and it'll return you the rest of the markdown. So we're going to do the exact same thing in our code. We will start, I'm going to open up main.go. We'll start by updating the post data type and just basically making it so it has all the fields that we need um, and also so it has the struct tags that we need. So I don't want that to be there. Um, so the first thing I want, well, I think I have a bug here. I think this is supposed to be template.html and looks like I have the wrong template package imported for some reason. Oh, that was my issue. That was actually a bug. Um, so the reason that this was working before is I was using the text template package, which I should not have been doing. Um, and because I was using it, it wasn't doing escaping for our content. But if I were to change this to the HTML template package and leave this as a string, what's going to happen is now when I run the server, go run main.co, it is going to actually escape all that HTML that we had for our blog posts. So you'll see here that it's escaping it all and just rendering out HTML. Um, it's doing this because it wants to avoid any side of, or any type of injection attacks. So it doesn't want somebody to be able to inject HTML into our page without us wanting it to, to be rendered correctly. So that's actually a good thing, but we actually want this content to be rendered as HTML. So the way we do that is we do template.html as the type, and we make sure we're using that temp HTML template package. So that gives us some more security so that we don't have any sort of issues but it also allows us to render this as HTML. So now I think this might still, yeah. Down here, I need to do template.html and convert this um, string into a template.html type. So template.html actually is just a string behind the hood, you know, under the hood, um, but it is a separate type. So unless it actually gets converted into that type, it won't work correctly. So we have to go ahead and do template.html to convert this buff.string into a template.html string. So now if we were to do go run main.go, our code shouldn't have any errors. And if we come back here and render it, it's now being rendered the way we would have expected. Okay, so with that bug fixed, um, we wanna go ahead and add the fields that we need. So the title here, um, I think this makes sense. It's already inside of our uh, front matter. Let me go ahead and make sure I save both these. Um, description and date, we're eventually probably gonna use them, but I'm not using them right now. So I'm just gonna kind of ignore them. Um, we're also going to want the author information because I am rendering that right now. So I'm going to come back here and I'm going to change this to author and then I'm going to add a new type author struct. And this is going to have a name, which is going to have a string and an email, which is going to be a string. All right. So we have all these different types. What we need to do now is add the TOML tags to them so that it can actually, um, so it knows which fields to take from the TOML and assign to each different field in Margot struct. So from here, I'm going to do the go add tags to struct fields, which is just something that's inside of um, VS Code. If you're using another editor of any sort, most Go editors that I'm aware of have some sort of support for this. So there should be something for struct tags. And you can do this by hand if you want. I'm just kind of showing you how to use this because I think it's valuable to know how to use the tooling so that you aren't constantly typing a bunch of extra things that you don't need to type. Um, I want this to be the TOML tags. 
I don't need this omit empty bit and I want it to be in snake case and template value, I don't need anything for that. Okay, so what this did was this generated all the struct tags for me and all of these are just using the default. So it took the original field name and it used snake case on it, so in this case title. If I had had title here, it would have used title here because it was using snake case. Okay, so now that that is all set up, um, the next thing I wanna do is go down here to our handler and I wanna update it so that it can now parse the front matter out. So this first bit's gonna stay basically the same. We get the slug, we pull the markdown, um, you know, we read the markdown from it. But from here, before we actually try to parse the markdown, we wanna go ahead and pull the front matter out. So we're gonna do var post is gonna be post data. And then we're gonna do remaining markdown. Error is going to be front matter dot parse. Uh, we wanna pass in the post markdown and we want to extract the, um, you know, we wanna decode the, the front matter into this post type. If error is not equal to nil, then we want to do http.error w, I can't type today, I apologize. W error parsing front matter, and then http.status internal server error, and then we'll return. All right, so let's go ahead and just save that and see where we end up. Um, Looks like there's two errors. The first is that we're not using remaining markdown. Um, that one's an easy one to fix. Down here when we start to parse the rest of the markdown, instead of using post markdown, we want to use the remaining markdown. The second is that this argument is supposed to be an io.reader and we're passing in a string. Um, that's easy enough to fix. We can do strings.newreader. And we'll um, basically, we'll pass the post.markdown into this function, strings.newreader, and this will turn the string into an io.reader that reads from the string. Um, that does basically raise the point that when we call our, our read function to read from a slug, this is returning a string and an error. And long term, we might want to consider refactoring this to return an io.reader and an error instead of a string. So that's something to consider, especially because if we're reading from a file, we're actually already getting an io.reader when we open the file. So it might actually make sense to read to return something like a, an io.read closer so that we can read from it and then close it. Um, that would allow us to avoid this whole step where right now what we're doing is we open a file, we read all the contents from the file into a string, we return it, and then we then turn that string back into a reader and we read from it. So those, you know, that's extra steps that don't really make sense. Um, but I'm not gonna do that now, I'm just gonna leave it as is until we get this functionality working and then we can come back and refactor that code later. Okay, so coming back down here, um, we have the front matter bit parsing, we then take the remaining markdown and we um, convert that over into the bytes. Or, and you know, we convert that into HTML and store it in this buff, which is a bytes.buffer. And then the last thing we wanna do is we wanna execute our template and we want to pass in the post data. So at this point, we already created a post data variable up there. So we're gonna go ahead and use that variable. So we're gonna pass in post and that should allow us to render the entire thing as expected. All right, so if all is going well, we should be able to go run main.go come back here and reload. And you'll see here that we have goes io.reader by John Calhoun. Um, this right here is being rendered weird. It looks like we had maybe had an error of some sort. I'm not really sure because we don't have any contents here. So there is a panic here, which isn't really ideal, but I'm gonna let that be for now. Um, not really sure why we're not getting the rest of it. My only guess oh i know the issue so here we have the byte stuff or the buffer that all the contents get put into but we never actually put that into the post so we need to do post dot content is going to be template dot html buff dot string before we were setting up the um down here and we had this execute when we set up the post data we were at assigning it to the content field there so here we just need to make sure that after we parse the uh, markdown and turn it into html that we assign it to the post dot content field so now if I were to stop and restart the server, come back here and reload, we'll see that we have all the contents being rendered from the markdown file. We have the author up here and we have the title up here. And if I were to go to the source, the title is being set correctly inside of the head tag too. So there's a couple things that I think are worth addressing from this point. The first is that the author is being rendered weirdly here. Um, and that's because we went from previously in our post.go.html, the author was just a string 
and now the author is not a string. The author is um, an object that has both a name and an email address. So I'm going to go ahead and um, just go ahead and replace this with some HTML, some you know, with the HTML templating syntax where we're going to say with author. Uh, we're going to go ahead and put a div with a margin bottom of six. It's going to have the author and it's going to have a mail to the email with the name. And then let's go ahead and just separate this onto two new lines a little bit. And let's stop and restart the server just to see how that looks first. All right, it says author John Calhoun. If we click into this, it appears to be a decent mail to link. So we should be good to go. Um, it's not opening more than likely because um, the browser I use for recording is not one that I have anything really set up with. So it doesn't really have an email client assigned to it. Um, but I think that should work unless I have a bug. But either way, you get the point. Um, the next thing that we want to fix is this double title part. You'll see here that we've got the title up here and then we have titles down here and it just seems weird having that duplicated. So there's a couple ways we could address this. One is that we could actually set up our parsing to extract this and never render it. Um, another is that we don't necessarily have to display the title from the title bit. We could just display it, you know, expect it to be inside of the markdown code. Um, either way is completely fine. Another option is to just expect people writing blog posts to not put it inside of the blog post or markdown. And that's something that I actually see quite commonly. Um, so basically what will happen is instead of putting this first H1 tag, you write a blog post like this, where the title was set up here, and you just go ahead and just get right into the writing here. You don't actually have to put the H1 tag there. You can still add things like, uh, next up, put more content here under the H2 tag. And then if you were to come back here, I don't know if this will reread this. Yes, it does. Okay. Um, you'll see here that it starts to look a little bit better because it no longer has the title duplicated, but we can still have H2 tags and things like that, and the page looks okay. Um, so that's the first option. Um, and then the, I, I think we're just going to stick with that. I think that makes the most sense. So let's go to the how to boil eggs one. We'll just get rid of it there as well. And now both of our blog posts should have um, a decent looking page, and everything starts to look decent. So again, this is just sort of we're making choices here based on what we think makes the most sense for our blog platform. And this is the one that I think most makes the most sense. I don't see any reason to have to write this content twice when I know the title is always going to be the same. Um, but if you have a different opinion on that, you can definitely, you know, go about it doing it whatever way you prefer. So that's it for this. Um, I think in the next video, we're going to go ahead and look at main.go and we're going to go ahead and start looking at ways to refactor this a little bit. Um, specifically, I mentioned that this, this slug reader, could potentially return an io.reader or an io read closer. Um, so we might explore that. Another option is to look at ways to render all of our blog posts because right now um, we have to know the URL of a blog post to get to it. We don't really have an index page that just shows you all the blog posts. So you see here, if I go to the home page, there's nothing set up here. So what I might go ahead and do in the next lesson is focus on creating that index page. I'm not sure which of those makes sense to focus on first. So I'll figure that out and then we'll go for the, you know, go through there. But those are the two next big steps I think we need to focus on.